As you may already know, June 1st, 2019 represents the 20th anniversary of the day that the Norfolk Southern and CSX divided among each other the big blue leviathan we knew as Conrail. I remember that time period well. And depending on your own point of view, Conrail could have been one of two things. For some, it was the savior of Northeastern railroading because it covered up the blackness of Penn Central. For others, it was the antichrist of rail transport since it was now a nationalized quasi-governmental monopoly that wiped out the corporate identities of no less than seven well-beloved smaller roads. I fell somewhere in the middle of all of that. Having come up with the Big Blue, I naturally gravitated to it because it was modern day railroading. On the other hand, during its last decade, Conrail seemed to be more interested in spinning off tracks than actually running trains, and Northeastern Pennsylvania was one of the first to be cast aside by Conrail as soon as the circumstances allowed for it. So it's with these mixed emotions that I felt that I should take this opportunity to reflect on all that Conrail has meant to me over the years prior to its fall. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The loss of Conrail in the late 1990s came at a time when so many of us were still coping with the loss of the Southern Pacific, the Chicago Northwestern, the Burlington Northern, and the Santa Fe. And those were the big railroads to fall. There were at least a dozen smaller roads that disappeared including our own Delaware and Hudson which made the 1990s, regardless of where you lived in America, a decade of decline for so many rail fans. So when the apocalyptic news of the CSX NS split of the Big Blue hit in 1997, railroading as I knew it was beginning to die. But I slowly made peace with the 21st century and even began to warm up to the black and white of the Norfolk Southern. And since the grave hadn't gotten completely cold yet, there was still a lot of ex-Conrail Blue roaming the rails to keep me at trackside. Today, remnants of Conrail Blue either sits in deadlines, abandoned sidings, or scrapyards. Occasionally, we can still see a piece of rolling stock in a train, but it's not blue, and it's certainly not the same anymore. But maybe that's a good thing. Conrail's demise was the beginning of Norfolk Southern's rise in northeastern Pennsylvania and with them came a new era of mainline railroading which is still going on strong to this day. This video is about Conrail, or what was Conrail, before Conrail quality and of course before it became a fallen flag.
start this trip down memory lane with a look at the Pennsylvania Power and Light Power Plant in Washingtonville, Pennsylvania, which is also known as Strawberry Ridge. During Conrail's heyday, several coal trains a day came into this plant, but nowadays it's lucky if it sees one coal train a week. This speaks volumes about the influx of cheap natural gas which is in abundance in the region. From our vehicle, we can see the loaded hoppers waiting to be unloaded. From almost the same spot many, many years earlier, we can see the same operation taking place with blue SD-40s in charge of moving the loads. Williamsport, Pennsylvania is the home of Little League Baseball. It's also the home of Newberry Yard, which until the mid-1990s was ground zero for many of the Conrail operations in central Pennsylvania. Today, it's ground zero for the North Shore system, specifically its like Cumming Valley Railroad subsidiary. Looking at a map, we can see the overall railroad infrastructure that still exists today. More to our interest is the Linden Y to the west on the ex-Pennsylvania Railroad Buffalo Line. This Y, which is made up of three control points, allowed trains to move to and from the Pennsylvania Railroad Buffalo Line in any direction into the Williamsport area, which was also home to the Reading Railroad and the New York Central. The Y consisted of C.P. Linden to the west, C.P. South Linden to the east, and C.P. River to the north. Looking toward the control points of Linden and South Linden in 2017, the Pennsylvania Railroad position light signal still spanned the now single track main line, but in the days of Big Blue and double track railroading, Conrail C39-8 number 8018, remember those engines? And another Big Blue brother moved light past C.P. South Linden. On the other side at C.P. Linden, the same two diesels continue west toward Lock Haven. Standing at the River Road crossing and looking north toward C.P. River, the Conrail era signal still guards the entrance to the bridge that crosses over the west branch of the Susquehanna River into Newberry and Williamsport. Today, this Y sees only minimal traffic, mostly locals scattered about the week. But in the days of blue, unit coal trains such as the one shown here were a common sight, as were special moves such as that steam engine being towed steadily making its way to the west. Take a look at that small shed at C.P. Linden now in 2017. Note how much it's changed since the days of Conrail as another pair of blue diesels, this time with train in tow, hustle racks westward. Around 1995, Conrail sold Newberry Yard and the accompanying facilities to the Cedar-Cog Joint Rail Authority to be operated by the Lycoming Valley Railroad. Before that, blue locomotives infested the yards such as the 6372 and the 7556. Moving east into Williamsport proper, a trio of Conrail diesels in their dress blues move west toward Newberry behind number 6805. That big building behind them is Bethlehem Steel and still stands to this day, although it's no longer occupied by its original tenant. The tracks are also still there today and are kept polished by the Lycoming Valley Railroad. Continuing east on this former Reading Railroad line, we come to C.P. Muncie. C.P. Muncie is actually located in the town of Sagers, which is also where the Copper's Industrial Plant is located. The town of Muncie itself is a few miles west up the line on the other side of the Susquehanna River. Looking south from the control point, way, way back in time, number 8054 moves on to what will become like Cumming Valley tracks in the days ahead with a string of racks and other mixed freight. Assuming that this train continues on undeterred, it will pass through Montoursville, Williamsport, and into the Newberry Yard. A few miles south railroad east in the town of Montgomery, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus train sits behind three Conrail Jeeps. It's the early 80s and the greatest show on earth is flying high in its home on the rails. Going further south, again railroad east, the Buffalo Line crosses eastward over the icy Susquehanna River behind General Electric 6579. Continuing south, we find ourselves at the station at Milton as the Conrail Office Car Special flies north. These engines are owned, operated, and maintained by Bennett Levin and his Juniata Terminal Company of Philadelphia and now wear their original Pennsylvania Railroad Tuscan Red and Gold Stripes. They made their last rounds on the main line back in December on the Marine Corps Reserve Capital Region Tours for Tot Special in upstate New York. On the other end of that station we caught the Lycoming Valley Railroad symbol LVRR1, an evening Northumberland turn as it moves south toward Northumberland. Both the Norfolk Southern and the Lycoming Valley Railroad used the Buffalo Line between C.P. Muncie and Northumberland Yard. At this time in 2017, these cars will end up on the next NS Train 11A that will move north up the Sunbury Line to Binghamton, New York. Today, these cars would be riding the H53 turn to Anoli Yard. 
Montandon, Pennsylvania has no special significance on the railroad that I know of, but because of the wide open shots like this that you can get, it's been a popular rail fanning location for decades. Whizzing past a classic Pennsylvania Railroad position light signal bridge, westbound piggyback train sings along the line behind number 3332. The location is near a place called Jack's. Further west near Spruce Creek, Pennsylvania, we're now getting close to the town of Tyrone as another piggyback train whizzes by with a GE in charge in what appears to be the class unit of the C39-8 family on Conrail. Raise your hand if you can remember those Conrail trail van trailers. Deep in the heart of anthracite coal country sits a little town known as Cressona. Before Conrail, this was pure Redding Railroad territory and now, today, after Conrail, it's pure Redding and Northern territory. Our last stop in this time traveling adventure is the massive Anoli Yard. In Conrail's time, a lone Union Pacific locomotive looks grossly out of place amid an ocean of blue. Take note of the Conrail painted on that big white tank to the left. Fast forward to 2016 and the armor yellow of Union Pacific, though more prevalent, still stands out among the blackness of Norfolk Southern. It won't be long before every one of those SD90 Max will be rebuilt as SD70 ACUs and shrouded in the black cloak of Norfolk Southern. Conrail did not have many crazy paint schemes, but every once in a while they had their moments. SD50 number 6726 was painted to honor the Olympic bike trials that were based in Altoona, and it's shown here at Altoona with what looks like a Paducah, Kentucky rebuild number 7567 sitting above it. Besides the bright blue paint, those red class lights are aspects of Conrail that I'll never forget. Over near the Rockville Bridge at CP Hip, a coal train rounds the curve at Sharps and into a Nolly Yard. Now firmly on the Rockville Bridge, SD40-2 number 6464 rounds the curve at Sharps. The fact that we could stand on the bridge is remembering that this is well before the days of 9-11 and every American became a potential terrorist in the eyes of the railroads. On the other side of the bridge on the east bank of the Susquehanna River, three EMDs come off the Buffalo line with coal hoppers in tow including one letter for the Louisville and Nashville. Just as the bridge at Duncannon is a popular spot for filming and photographing trains today, so it was in Conrail's day. Note the position light signals on both sides of the third unit long gone today. Ever since the days of the Pennsylvania Railroad steam engines, Bell Vista Drive aka the Rail Fans Bridge has been the place for shooting trains at the north end of Enola Yard. The tradition continues on to this day though Brunswick Green and Premier Blue Diesels have long faded into history giving way to the monochromatic black and white of the Norfolk Southern. So here we are back in the modern day and the only Conrail locomotive plying the mainline rails is the Norfolk Southern Heritage Unit number 8098. Regardless of your feelings for the big blue, it's rarely ever a happy occasion when a railroad flag falls. The 21st century saw us go from the era of the Super 7 of the 1990s to the big four rail systems of the 2000s. Neither of those sound quite right. This was a look at the consolidated railroad company we knew as Conrail when it was truly Conrail.
10 miles north of Allentown, Pennsylvania, on State Route 145, across the Lehigh River, is the cozy little village of Triclers. Situated in Northampton County, the town is named after Henry Trichler. Off Blue Mountain Drive is a tiny little street called Breadfruit Drive. To the casual observer, it's just an abandoned dead end, but to the rail fan, there's something more going on. The now out-of-service Mauser Mill is located here. The five-story roller mill originally drew water to power its turbine from the Lehigh Canal. In 1891, the mill contained one Victor brush in the basement, seven sets of rolls, two run of stone, and one Silver Creek smutter on the first floor, two flower packers and four purifiers on the second floor, and three chests and a brand duster in the attic. The mill was originally built by Berlin F. Bow as Franklin Mills in 1871, but the story begins even further back than that. David Kuntz established the mill in 1794 and the town was called Kuntzford. When Henry Trichler became the owner of the Kuntz Mill, the town became known as Trichlers. In 1862, Jacob Mauser established a grain mill that became one of the largest grist mills in the Northeast. Mauser also had a mill in Laurie Station and on Canal Street in Northampton. The firm was recognized for Mauser's Best Flour, a staple on the shelves of many former neighborhood stores. Both the Laurie's Mill and the Northampton Mill were destroyed by fire, but its flagship mill here in Triclers was operated by the Mauser family from 1882 until the late 1960s. In the 1970s, it became a part of ConAgra Grain Processing, the large Midwest milling conglomerate of then Omaha, Nebraska. ConAgra is a worldwide company with plants all over, including this one in Milton, Pennsylvania. And if those ConAgra covered hoppers look familiar to you, they should. They were a common sight on the now abolished trains 10A and 11A. ConAgra is also the parent company of Lamb Weston, who we talked about in America's Coolest Trains. ConAgra used the mill to grind oat flowers until 2014. After that, the landmark mill closed and the milling era ended in the village. So why are we here? Triclers used to be a stop for the Central Railroad of New Jersey. If you're hip to Northeastern Railroad history, then you may know that the CNJ departed Pennsylvania in 1972, ceding its Pennsylvania rail operations to the Lehigh Valley Railroad. The valley was folded into Conrail in 1976, and this stretch of track became part of Conrail's Lehigh Line. Conrail was split between Norfolk Southern and CSX in 1999, giving NS ownership of the line. Since Conrail's formation in 1976, the Delaware and Hudson has had trackage rights over the Lehigh Line, which was inherited by the Canadian Pacific when they took over the DNH in 1991. CP ran several trains a day over the Lehigh Line, including what NS classified as the 39Z, which we can see here moving northbound past the mill on April 30, 2010. Those loaded trash gondolas at the front of the train and the intermodal containers are an easy indication that this train originated in Oak Island, New Jersey. Note the Burlington Northern hopper spotted on the siding and another covered hopper spotted at the mill.
In this episode of Conrail Today, we pick up where we left off in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, where six boxcar red survivors of the era of the Big Blue passed the time away mingling in the ex-Pennsylvania Railroad, ex-Penn Central, ex-Conrail, now Norfolk Southern Lock Haven Yard. A rare find, Conrail BE-52B, boxcar number 267043, still has its high brake wheel and the stands for its roof walks. Conrail inherited a whole fleet of these former Erie 50-foot double-door boxcars built in the 1950s, several of which survived in captive, though non-interchange, auto parts service into the 1990s. This rare survivor is a storage car in the shared NS Nittany Bald Eagle Yard in Lock Haven, PA, as seen here in the summer of 2020. Also in this lineup is Conrail Boxcar Type X58A, number 164150, which can also be seen on that same summer day. Closer to home, Reading and Northern EMD SW1500 number 1548 was built in August 1969 as the Reading number 2768 and later became Conrail number 9618. It's seen here in Taylor Yard in 2017, painted in the Reading and Northern's Reading inspired scheme. And just six days before I caught these former Upper Marion and Plymouth open hoppers on a Hallbaker Stone train heading towards the Western New York and Pennsylvania interchange at Driftwood, I caught one of their flat cars moving southbound through town on the train 11Z. The Upper Marion and Plymouth was owned by the defunct Allenwood Steel Company of Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. It shuffled rail cars to plants on both sides of the Schuylkill River and interchanged with the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Penn Central, and the Reading, all the way into Conrail. Its motor power consisted of Baldwin and Alco rebuilds such as the S6 and the VO1000, and I believe that they may have had other in-cab switchers such as the SWs and the NW units, as well as a whole lot of open hoppers, as evidenced by the Stone Train. The Upper Marion and Plymouth reporting mark UMP Railroad still operates in Conshohocken at the old Allenwood Steel Plant. The mill became Luke and Steel, then Bethlehem Lucan's Plate, and now it is named something else. The UMP actually has nothing to do with the Chester Valley Branch or the East Penn Railway, other than the fact that, last that I knew, the UMP number 9008 was the motor power on that branch. And in addition to the mill in Conshohocken, the UMP serviced the chemical plant, the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper, and a scrapyard. <laughs> 